autumn. Hello, darlings, dearests of the world. Um, welcome back. I hope you're doing so, so well. My name is Emma. If you are new here, it's so lovely to have you. Um, and it's so nice to meet you. So hi. Today we are doing another episode of The Rex Room in a whole new bedroom. I'm really excited. It's coming together in here really nicely. I'm trying to just make it as cozy as possible. So this episode is going to be cozy books for autumn, for fall, for September. Just cozy goodness, really. Most of these books are really lighthearted, really fun, wonderful, feel-good comfort books. For a couple of these, I did include a few cozy books with a few darker themes in it so that you can kind of maybe segue them into your spooky TBR for October and Halloween if you want. But I do have a whole episode of this from last year, completely different book. So if you want to check that one out, I will link it up above. Also filled with so many cozy books that like I had to keep reminding myself not to put on this list this time around, but these picks are just wonderful. So I'm just going to start... I think with one of my favorites that I really want to read soon. This one was a gift from one of you guys. Thank you so much. It didn't come with a note, so I don't know who I have to thank for sending me my neighbor, Totoro. Yeah, this is the novel. So this one is the original story and arts by Miyazaki. And then the novel itself is by Sugi Kokubo. So, so excited to read this. I watched this movie for the first time this year. Um, Studio Ghibli has just been something that's been a blessing in my life since I started watching the films this year, um, and it's just been the most amazing thing ever. So if you are unfamiliar with the story, I highly recommend you check it out. It is so wonderful. Essentially, we have two sisters and their father who move into the Japanese countryside, and they move into like a haunted house. They think it's haunted. There's some weird things that are going on inside. It's very spooky. It's all set from like, you know, the pure imagination and the perspective of these two young sisters who are 11 and a bit younger than that as well. Probably like four or five, honestly, or six. I forget how old children are. <laughs> Soon they discover this forest spirit named Todoro, who is this, of course, lovingly beautiful, big thing that you just want to hug. It's so sweet. It's so wholesome, but it also deals with a lot of trauma. They also have their mother who is staying at a nearby hospital for some unknown health problems. Um, and this book just deals with so much. The film is wonderful to analyze as well at a deeper level if you are interested in that. And the book, of course, um, I just cannot imagine the coziness, the comfort that is in the book because there's so much in the movie. This one also comes with, like I said, some illustrations and stuff like that from Miyazaki himself, I believe. So just so incredibly excited to get into this acorn filled, cozy, magical, also slightly spooky book um, and just experience it all over again in a different media form. So that is my neighbor Totoro. It's just, I just can't recommend this to you guys enough. Like it's just, wow just so good. So that is that one. I wanted to put a couple of classics on here. You guys know that I find fairy tales, fantasy, fairy tale retellings, collections, all that stuff extremely cozy. I find it's perfect for winter or the autumn um, and it just makes life seem like a bit more magical, you know? So this one I decided to put on The Turnip Princess and Other Newly Discovered Fairy Tales. I read this collection a couple months ago, really enjoyed it. I listened to the audiobook and this was just really good fun. Like I said, these fairy tales are newly discovered. I believe in 2012, they're found in a box in Germany. <laughs> so everyone was like, well, we have new fairy tales on our hands. And these ones are interesting because a lot of them subvert the kind of fairy tales that we hold at a standard and as the standard, namely the Brothers Grimm, the tropes in there, um, especially gender tropes and stuff like that. So this collection was doubly interesting because it was just something new that I hadn't experienced in a lot of fairy tales. So essentially this was compiled by Franz Saver von Schoenwert in the 1850s and he went all over Bavaria and the upper Palatinate region and he collected all of these stories from everyone there. So it's just wonderful. It's, it's probably what you would expect. It's people transforming into animals, there's princesses, princes, monsters, it's just wonderful, like it's very cozy. I do want to say these fairy tales are quite snappy, they leave out a lot of the description and atmosphere that I really find makes it cozy, but just like going through it and it's kind of like you're being verbally told just what is happening, it, you can kind of imagine you're sitting around like a fire or something like that um, and listening to these old tales being told, it's just, I don't know, it gets you in a, gets you in a type of mood, so that is, um, these fairy tales 
also recommend. Speaking of fantasy and stuff like that, Heart of the Fae by Emma Hamm is also an extremely comforting read. I can just, uh, I cannot recommend this one enough. This is absolutely beautiful. This one involves fairies and different creatures, and we also follow our protagonist, who is a healer, but a lot of the townspeople in the town where she lives believe her to be a witch because her mother was burned at the stake. Everyone accused her of being a witch, and so now our protagonist is just kind of, you know, drifting having to deal with all of these accusations from villagers. All she really wants to do is cure the town from this blood beetle plague. And so when she hears news that the cure for this plague may reside on this far off isle, she goes in search of this isle and finds the kind of fey prince who has been exiled to this island and who lives there. It is also a Beauty and the Beast retelling, so it's just full of like so much atmosphere and those slow moments that I really crave when I want to feel cozy and when I really want to like envelop myself in the reality of a book like it's those little moments in like studio Ghibli's films that like really make you feel grounded like the way people's hair moves the way the blade of grass moves maybe a certain smell or something like that and this book really had it all right it had those moments of like baking bread as well as going for walks, collecting herbs. I love books where a character is like a healer or works with medicine and natural remedies because I just find that extremely cozy. It makes me feel like I can be a little potion maker in my house listening to <laughs> protagonists do stuff and whip stuff up and there's also just such a wonderful hint of magic. Um, the plot was great, the romance is great. I just loved everything about this. I loved our main character so much so I'd highly recommend Heart of the Fae. It's also a series so... This one, one of my best friends recently gifted to me, and this one is a graphic novel called Everyone's a Alia Bin When You're a Alia Bin 2. This one is by Jomini Sun, and this one just sounds so sweet. This is like probably the definition of wholesome. So we follow Jomini, who is an alien sent to study Earth. He always feels alone, he always feels apart, he always feels himself other, even among his own species, aliens of his kind. Um, but he feels at home for the first time among the creatures of Earth. So he comes to study our planet and he makes friends along the way. And this is essentially like his log of meeting <laughs> people and trees and different animals um, and eggs. Why are you so worried? You're an egg. Oh god, that's what I have to tell myself. Why are you so worried? You're an egg. But it also just deals with like, you know, feeling like you're not a part of something or feeling lost. A bear is tired of other creatures running in fear. An egg struggles to decide what to hatch into. A puppy is unable to express its true feelings. And bees think long and hard about what love means. Birds try to eat the sun. Nothingness questions its own existence. A ghost comes to terms with dying, and an introverted hedgehog slowly lets Jomini see its artistic insecurities. I just, I think I need to pick this up this month because it is so, oh god, it just looks so cute. And you just get like these animals of earth telling you super important life lessons and wisdom beyond your wildest dreams. Yeah, I can just, <laughs> I cannot wait to read this. So that is everyone's alien, but when you're an alien, let you know how this goes. I'll probably include a reading vlog of this, reading just feel-good books, but a lot of you guys have been asking for feel-good, comforting, happy books, um, books that don't make you question your whole existence. Although this one might, but like in a good way, you know, reaffirm it, let you know what's going on, um, and just make you feel comforted and at home no matter where you are, I think is the goal of this book. So yes, that is that one. This next one is definitely some murder mystery coziness. That is definitely a really specific genre that like, I think the market for that has just been monopolized on so much recently because every time I go on Libby, the audiobook app, I just see so many cozy murder mysteries, which is an interesting phenomenon. I think I would like to do a deep dive on. Why do people think it's so cozy? I think it's, I mean, I think it's cozy, so I should ask myself that as well, but like, what is so cozy about <laughs> hunting down someone's murderer? I don't know, but it could be Agatha Christie's fault. But yeah, I had to throw some Agatha Christie on here. I just think she's perfect. I have one of her audiobooks on hold right now. I think it's The Murder of Roger Ackroyd is the next one I am going to be reading because I'm trying to follow along Poirot series in order, but this is one I have on my shelves that I haven't yet read. This is The Golden Ball and Other Stories, so this is like a collection of little short stories. I just think she's perfect. I really do. Uh, not as a person, I mean like perfect for autumn <laughs> um, and fall and like it is that like nice atmospheric writing. You get that just like very lulling comfort 
whether it feels like you're on a train solving murder mysteries with her. I don't recommend Murder on the Orient Express, I didn't love that one. Any other Agatha Christie book you want to pick up for like the fall or autumn or just for feeling cozy, I think it's a great way to spend an evening, whether you're reading it, listening to a book, trying to solve it yourself. I just think it's so much fun and like it really... I don't know, it's just there's something about it that you can't put your finger on, you can't describe, but you know that murder mysteries are just the essential, quintessential coziness. So that is Agatha Christie. Um, yeah, let me know what like your favorite, if you have a favorite Agatha Christie novel. I don't think I do yet because I don't think I've really read one that I've loved, love, love, loved so much. So maybe the next one will be that one for me. Next up, we have a middle grade that is kind of like this, but definitely not as much gore, blood, death, or awful things. This is The Mysterious Benedict Society by Trenton Lee Stewart. I read this book many years ago, but from what I remember, it is just oh, the sweetest middle grade. It is very fun. It's bursting with mysteries and atmosphere, um, and I believe there's a movie out now about it, so that's cool too. But it all begins with an ad that is put in the newspaper saying, are you a gifted child looking for special opportunities? Where are my fellow gifted children from like elementary school who excelled far too much in public school, and now you're just burnt out adults who read too much? Hi. So all these children are like, oh, I'm smart, let me enroll in this competition, but in the end, I believe only four, yeah, four very special children um, succeed. This book also like defies that like specialness and that intelligence because that's not really what the skill set they're looking for is, right? The four children that get picked all have super different abilities um, and affinities towards different things that they're really good at. So for example, someone's just a really good climber. But it's also about a whole bunch of children who feel like they don't fit in anywhere, coming together, making friends. There's a lot of found family tropes. Definitely reminds me of Lemony Snicket in a bunch of different ways, um, but also there's some quite serious things going on. They have to solve plots that could potentially destroy the world and stuff like that. It's just, it was just fun. It was just really, really fun and besides that it is like a book full of puzzles that you as the reader can kind of solve alongside them and stuff like that which i really love there's a whole bunch of different kinds of puzzles and it's just like full of mysteries um, and things to do and things to solve and it's not like a choose your own adventure by any means but it's definitely an adventure where you as the reader i think are a big participant in it which makes it so fun um very cozy very atmospheric like i said a graphic novel that i really really want to read this september and i think it's perfect for like going back to school especially because feeling a bit anxious not only about going back after a while but we've just we're in a global pandemic so cut me some slack, cut yourself some slack, um, and that is Comey Can't Communicate. This is a manga series. This is by Tomohito Oda, and I <laughs> I bought this a really long time ago, but I think now is like the perfect time to read it because it is set in a school and we're following Comey, but she has a communication disorder. However, everyone interprets, everyone around her interprets her silence, her aloofness, um, as she is just so cool. She's just like above them. She doesn't talk to anyone because she's just too cool cool for them. She's in like a whole other league. Um, but we have this boy who eventually talks to her and finally realizes that no, she's not being aloof. She is just crippled with anxiety of communicating and talking to other people. But she reveals to him that she has a goal of making a hundred friends no matter what. She wants to conquer this communication disorder that she has and she wants to make a hundred friends. So the boy that she makes friends with is Tadano and he is also a total wallflower, but he kind of likes it that way. But they have a connection, they become really good friends and then they make it a quest to make a hundred friends, um, which I think is just, uh, it's just gonna be so wholesome, so sweet. I cannot wait to read this, get so invested and also just like, you know, take some strength from it and convince myself that maybe I'll actually talk to someone in my uni classes this time. Probably not gonna happen. I really think I might even pick this up today. Actually, we'll see. We'll see. So that is that one. Another very cozy classic is A Little Princess by Sarah Hodgson Burnett. Oh, this is wonderful. This is just so wonderful. I highly, highly recommend. It is so... You just feel this book in your bones, I think, a little bit. We're following a young girl named Sarah, and when her rich father dies, she is left in the care of like a boarding school, kind of an orphanage, a class, you know, but she is relegated now to basically being a maidservant, helping in the kitchen, cooking, cleaning, and all of that stuff. She is treated horribly. She's basically gone from riches to rags, but this book is essentially about the power of imagination, and it's just, I don't know, I just found it so cozy because 
she's pretty much trapped in like this attic room, right? And she is like a little princess, but everyone now kind of uses that name to mock her. She just like never gives up on her situation. She never lets her condition make her less kind. She's just always brimming with like goodness and light and kindness, no matter her situation. And it's just really inspiring, but also so cozy to just like be beside her imagining things and like going about your own life and kind of letting your imaginative side make things better for you if you feel like you need that in some area of your life, which I really did. And it was just wonderful. The writing was amazing, so sweet, so wholesome, but also very touching, super comforting. Um, there's so many cold scenes in this book. There's so much food in this book. I just really, really enjoyed it. So that is A Little Princess. I would also recommend this for winter as well um, because I think Christmas is in this book. So yeah. This next one I think is perfect for maybe starting your cozy... This next one I think is perfect for maybe starting your like descent into cozy dumb <laughs> um, and comforts. It was the last kind of summary book that I wanted to read and then it was just, it ended up being like the perfect segue. So that is From Little Tokyo with Love by Sarah Kuhn. This was incredible. I gave this four stars. Um, I just finished this up in the first week of September and I really, really thoroughly enjoyed it. In this one, we are following Rika and since childhood, she has been staying with the family of her aunt, her aunts and her cousins um, and she's never really felt like she belongs in Little Tokyo in LA, which is the community she has grown up in because she is Japanese American and the people in Little Tokyo haven't treated her with the greatest respect or treated her that nicely at all. But this book just takes place over like, I think a week or a little over a week um, during a festival in Little Tokyo. And it was just so, it was just so wonderful and also so magical. And you go on like this adventure because Rika is trying to track down her mother who she thinks is this like famous movie star named Grace Kimura. And she is going on this like, essentially scavenger hunt trying to find her mom trying to find who she is trying to find what she wants to be how to fit in and along the way she's accompanied by a famous like dancer actor movie man <laughs> named hank chen and their relationship was so sweet hank chen is like he's just wonderful he's so wonderful um just such a good person and just oh loved him loved both of them um, and it was just so wonderful. Like this book is filled with those like little nooks and crannies and you could really tell Sarah Kuhn had so much love for Little Tokyo. The descriptions, the places you get to go, like it feels, it feels like I went there. I got to experience the whole journey with them. So I just really, really loved it. There's just so many important pieces to this book. I loved it endlessly. Um, so it was just so fun. And besides that, it was like a nice segue into autumn because it's filled with like shadows, dark spaces. You get to go to like the observatory, you get to go to museums and libraries, and you just get to go on this little ride through little Tokyo. It was wonderful. So that is that one. Finally, the one that is a good segue into like spooky kind of proper. This is A Dark Academia, If We Were Villains. I feel like this might actually be my favorite Dark Academia book because I haven't actually enjoyed many of the ones that I've read, but this is by M.L. Rio. It takes so much inspiration from Shakespeare because we are at a conservatory for the performing arts. We follow seven characters who are all in the Shakespeare program and, you know, they're studying Shakespeare, they're performing Shakespeare, but it starts to take over their lives and when one of their group is found dead, all of a sudden things start to explode. I think my favorite thing about this book is not only like the school setting, getting back into it, you, can, you really feel the passion from these people that they just love studying Shakespeare and it makes you want to like get into that world but there are so many cool scenes in this book my favorite scenes are the ones where they're putting on different Shakespeare plays like Macbeth Romeo and Juliet King Lear and like the setting and the stage and the way that she just like takes you through the play like they they put on Macbeth on Halloween on the beach that was like my favorite scene in the book and then in their romeo and juliet performance like it's just so atmospheric it's so wonderful i loved the descriptions it just feels like you're there it feels like a scene you want to inhabit i wanted to be on that beach so badly watching this play at midnight on halloween and just like it's infused with so much love for shakespeare it's wonderful it's great this book definitely i have a few critiques of it but overall i would say the atmosphere and just like that pervasive Shakespearean-ness that like sprinkled all over this book. 
really worth it and I really really enjoyed it. And besides that, like I said, it's pretty dark. There's the murder mystery. There's a lot of different things going on in this book too. So that is if we were villains. All right, so those are my cozy book recommendations. I definitely have like a huge huge Halloween spooky season recommendation coming but I like to kind of slide into it with some cozy books while the leaves like just start to change color and stuff like that so if you have any cozy books um, you want to recommend to all of us here please let me know please just pop them in the comments and as well if you have ideas of what you'd like to see for the next rex room also let me know but thank you so much for watching i hope you enjoyed if you read any of these and like them please let me know you're having the coziest time of the year and i'll see you very soon in my next video love you guys so much my stomach had to say goodbye too did you hear that <laughs> ciao